Life on Earth, a grand tapestry woven across billions of years, is a saga filled with startling transformations and breakthroughs. From the first stirrings of life in the ancient oceans, through the rise of multicellularity and the explosive diversity of the Cambrian period, to the colonization of land by ambitious creatures. Sea, land, air, no realm remained untouched by life's relentless drive. And in the heart of these shifts, a certain group of vertebrates began to leave their own indelible mark, the mammals. But this journey towards dominance was anything but straightforward. There were setbacks, catastrophes even, but life marched on, dusted itself off and began anew. And then, there's the part that is truly mind-boggling. But ah, patience, my dear listeners, for that part you'll discover soon enough. Hey there, Curiosity Explorers. You're tuned in to Curiosity Wonderland, and I'm your guide, Caesar. Along for the ride, as always, is our brilliant commentator, Sonia. Hi, everyone. Just as eager as you all are to dive into today's adventure. So buckle up. And folks, let's remember to subscribe, share, and comment. Your feedback shapes our journey. Stay curious, stay tuned. Now, it's fascinating to think that life on Earth, including us humans, didn't come about through a predetermined path. Instead, it evolved through a series of events that were, well, miraculous, but not obligatory. When you consider the scope of the universe, the presence of life-supporting conditions on Earth was sheer serendipity. Initially, Life was all about simple, microscopic organisms. So, when did all the complexity and diversity we see today start to come into play? Great question. It took billions of years for life to become more complex and differentiated. Four major developments played a critical role here. Horizontal gene transfer, the evolution of eukaryotic cells, multicellularity, and sexual reproduction. Horizontal gene transfer, that sounds interesting. Could you give an example to help us understand it better? Absolutely. Think about bacteria. They can actually swap genes with each other. So if a bacterium has developed a resistance to a particular antibiotic, it can pass that resistance gene to another bacterium. And just like that, the recipient bacterium becomes resistant too. That's horizontal gene transfer. Now moving on to eukaryotic cells. These are cells that have a nucleus and other specialized structures which allow them to perform unique functions. Picture a tiny factory with different departments, each handling a specific task. Then comes multicellularity. This allows cells to specialize even further and work together to form larger organisms. Like your skin cells are different from your heart cells, right? They have different jobs in the body. Lastly, there's sexual reproduction. This is where two parents mix their genes to create offspring that are genetically different from them. This genetic diversity increases the chances of survival. That's fascinating. And all these developments led to the Cambrian explosion you mentioned earlier? Exactly. This was when life really took off in terms of diversity and complexity. But the journey to the emergence of mammals and their rise to prominence was a lengthy one, spanning almost half a billion years. The story of our evolution is truly a testament to the resilience and adaptability of life. This talk about evolution takes me back to my childhood. I used to love catching bugs in the backyard. I remember being so fascinated by their variety, their different shapes, sizes, and how each one had its own unique way of moving. Ah, a budding naturalist from the start. It seems so. But the idea of a dominant species is what's really interesting me now. You'd think once a species is dominant, it'd stay that way indefinitely, right? Not necessarily. You see, Unless there's a massive selection pressure, like an extinction event, that could fundamentally shift the balance of life, then yes, the dominant species usually remains dominant. So an extinction event could be the catalyst for a change in the pecking order. Exactly. And these extinction events can be caused by various factors, both internal and external to Earth. For instance, the emergence from a snowball Earth scenario, which was a severe, widespread glaciation, may have directly led to the Cambrian explosion. Now the Cambrian explosion, that was around 550 million years ago, was when life became complex and differentiated on Earth. This was a sharp contrast to the prior four billion years of Earth's history. 
And what were the critical stages leading up to the Cambrian explosion? Well, firstly, the development of bilateral symmetry happened, which means animals now had tops, bottoms, fronts, and backs. Then, around 580 million years ago, deuterostomes and protostomes appeared for the first time. Deuterostomes, protostomes? Yes, deuterostomes include all animals with spinal cords, and protostomes include insects, crustaceans, and arachnids. And then came the first animal trails, suggesting these creatures were moving under their own power. Shh, that's incredible. In a way, it's like my bug collection, each one unique in its own right, but part of a broader ecosystem. That's a great way to put it. And this conversation wouldn't be complete without referencing our earliest known relatives, the chordates, which included creatures resembling lampreys, hagfish, and eels. All animals with spinal cords, including us humans, can trace their ancestry back to these primitive creatures. It's mind-boggling to think about, isn't it? We've come a long way from those early beginnings. My bug collection suddenly seems quite significant in the grand scheme of things. It certainly does. Now as we delve deeper into Earth's history, about 10 million years after the first appearance of trilobites, we start to see a great diversity of body types showing up in the fossil record. These trilobites, some of which were as large as 70 centimeters or just over 2 feet, looked like enormous lice. They dominated the oceans for about the next 200 million years. But life wasn't restricted to the ocean for long. Around 500 million years ago, the first animals started exploring land, followed by plants around 20 million years later, which rapidly colonized the coastal areas and eventually, the entire continental surface. Meanwhile, fish were evolving. Around 460 million years ago, they split into two groups, bony fish, like salmon and trout, and cartilaginous fish, like sharks, which have skeletons made of cartilage rather than bone. Despite the catastrophic Ordovician mass extinction event 440 million years ago, which wiped out about 86% of all species, ocean life remained the dominant form of life on Earth. This mass extinction event, thought to be caused by a rapid ice age, opened up a wide range of ecological niches, which were soon filled by new forms of life. Some surviving fish became lobe-fin fishes, which eventually evolved into amphibians, reptiles, dinosaurs, birds, and mammals. Others became ray-fin fishes, which evolved into most modern fish. Interestingly, so-called living fossils, like coelacanths and lungfish, evolved 420 million years ago from the lobe-fin fishes. Their descendants remain, largely unchanged, even today. Additionally, around 400 million years ago, the first insects evolved while land plants began developing woody stems. In the same time frame, the first four-legged animals, known as tetrapods, evolved and moved from freshwater habitats onto land. Once these tetrapods arrived on land, they were never successfully displaced by any other organism, despite all the extinction events that followed. It's a testament to how organisms adapt and evolve in the face of changing environments. Now the story of life on Earth continues with the advent of trees, around 385 million years ago. Life was thriving, both on land and in the oceans. But then, about 375 million years ago, a sudden shift occurred, with the next great mass extinction, the Late Devonian Extinction. It's believed that algal blooms exhausted the oxygen in the oceans, causing the suffocation and death of about 75% of all marine species. Yet, as we know, life is resilient. After every great extinction event, life typically resurges in quantity, biomass, and diversity. And so it did after around 35 million years, when amphibians rose to prominence, around 340 million years ago. And around this time, the Dimetrodon, a large carnivorous reptile, became the apex predator on land, ruling for millions of years. An interesting fact to note about the Dimetrodon is that while it bears a resemblance to dinosaurs, it's actually a synapsid reptile, more closely related to modern mammals. Fast forward to about 310 million years ago, and we see a significant evolutionary split. On one side, we have sauropsids, which would evolve into modern reptiles, dinosaurs, and birds. On the other side, we have synapsids, which included creatures like Dimetrodon, and would eventually evolve into all the mammals that have ever populated Earth. Trees were spreading across Earth, oxygen levels rose to the highest point in history, around 35% compared to our modern-day level of 21%. This oxygen-rich environment allowed animals to grow to giant sizes, including creatures similar to today's dragonflies, millipedes, and scorpions. 
And then, the most devastating mass extinction event known to our planet occurred, the end Permian extinction, also known as the Great Dying. The cause is still unknown, but the effect was devastating, with 96% of species on Earth going extinct. Trilobites, that had already been devastated by the previous extinction event, finally became extinct. The Dimetrodon and its relatives were wiped out, and only a few therapsids survived. Post the Great Dying, there was a significant power shift. Sauropsids, once overshadowed by synapsids, started to dominate the world, giving rise to dinosaurs and large ocean-dwelling reptiles. And what happened to the synapsids? Well, they survived, but in a much different form, as small nocturnal creatures. These synapsids eventually evolved into our mammalian ancestors. One particular synapsid group, the cynodonts, first appeared around 260 million years ago. These creatures developed dog-like teeth, and their descendants became the first warm-blooded creatures on Earth around 200 million years ago. So these cynodonts set the stage for the mammals we know today? Exactly. But not before going through another mass extinction, the end Triassic extinction, which wiped out 80% of the species. Following this, it was the dinosaurs' turn to rule, becoming the dominant form of animal life on land about 200 million years ago. And when did the first signs of birds start appearing? Great question. Bird-like features began appearing in certain dinosaur populations shortly after they became dominant. We see evidence in the form of bird-like footprints, feathering, and even vestigial wings, which helped these running animals maintain balance. Meanwhile, large crocodiles evolved, and with their arrival, the last remaining giant amphibians disappeared. As for mammals, the synodont descended ones survived while most other synapsids went extinct. What about the evolution of different types of mammals? Oh, that's an interesting part. Around 180 million years ago, the egg-laying mammals like the duck-billed platypus and echidna split off from the rest of the mammals. Further diversification happened around 140 million years ago, resulting in marsupials and placental mammals. And koalas are among these marsupials, right? Yes, they are. But despite their cuteness, koalas are considered the least intelligent and least evolved among all marsupials, having the smallest brain-to-body size ratio of any extant mammal. This next part of our evolutionary journey is fascinating. Marsupials, which are so commonly associated with Australia, actually originated in Southeast Asia. They migrated through the Americas, Antarctica, and finally arrived in Australia. Now shifting to the plant world, conifers started as the dominant form of tree, but they got a new set of competitors. Flowering plants, or angiosperms, came onto the scene about 130 million years ago and eventually dominated the Cretaceous period. In the oceans, marine reptiles such as the plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and others including ammonites, squids, and octopi were making a splash. On land about 100 million years ago, the largest and most famous dinosaurs, including the forerunners of Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops, along with the largest land animals of all time, the sauropods, dominated the landscape. The skies were filled with birds, pterosaurs, and insects, suggesting a rich and biodiverse planet. That reminds me, Cesar, of that time we visited the Natural History Museum and saw those dinosaur fossils. It was amazing. Absolutely. And you remember, Sonia, we saw a depiction of a small mammal that would have lived during the very late Cretaceous period. It was a rodent, similar to the modern nutria. Creatures like these lived in abundance just before an asteroid arrived that would wipe out the large reptiles, dinosaurs, birds, and more. Yes, I remember. Coincidentally, I spotted a nutria near the river the other day. It was fascinating to watch. It's incredible to think of the connection, isn't it? Now to continue our story, about 95 million years ago, an evolutionary split occurred among the placental mammals leading to the rise of different groups like horses, pigs, dogs, bats, anteaters, armadillos, elephants, aardvarks, and even primates, rodents, and lagomorphs. The diversity of life on Earth truly is astounding. As we continue our journey about 75 million years ago, another significant split occurs. The ancestors of modern primates split off from the remaining Uarchontoglyres, a group that includes rodents and legomorphs. Interestingly, rodents became the most biologically successful mammal, making up a whopping 40% of all modern mammals. 
So it's safe to say that rodents are survivors? Absolutely. They have adapted and thrived through countless environmental changes and challenges. Another leap forward occurred about 70 million years ago in the plant world. This was when the first grasses evolved. However, just four to five million years later, a catastrophic event affected Earth, the end Cretaceous extinction. Was this the asteroid event that we commonly hear about? Exactly. A massive asteroid struck the Gulf of Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula, creating the Chicxulub Crater. This event triggered an extinction wiping out massive classes of species, all of the non-avian dinosaurs, pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and ammonites. In total, 75% of all species in the world went extinct at this time. So this was the end for the reign of the dinosaurs? Yes, it was. But in the wake of this destruction, the small mammals survived and were least affected by this catastrophe. Eventually, these mammals and birds went on to dominate the land population of animals. So in a way, the extinction event paved the way for mammals and birds to thrive. That's a great way to look at it. This event was devastating, but it also reshaped the world and opened new opportunities for other species. As we've learned, major extinction events, while devastating, often pave the way for new species to develop and grow to prominence. With the dinosaurs out of the picture, Mammals, having already diversified to occupy a variety of niches, were poised to make that enormous leap. It's interesting to contemplate the timescales here. Compared to a 13.8 billion year old universe, a short interval of 65 million years is practically nothing. Yet, when we look back 65 million years from the present day, we find that 99.5% of the universe's history had already unfolded. But despite the age of the universe, the ancestors of what would become modern humans were at that point no better developed than a modern-day lemur. Complex, differentiated animals had already existed for half a billion years. But it was, it seems, mere chance that led to the rise of an intelligent, technologically advanced species like us. We do not yet know what secrets other planets hold as far as life's development and evolution goes. But here on Earth, the most remarkable story of all was just beginning to get truly interesting. It's so fascinating to think about how all these events shaped the world as we know it, and to realize that we are part of this ongoing story of evolution and adaptation. Indeed, it's a humbling perspective. It makes one appreciate the complexity and the interconnectedness of life on Earth. So there we have it, the incredibly complex and remarkable story of life on Earth. From the microscopic beginnings, through the Cambrian explosion, the rise of the trilobites and the reign of the dinosaurs, to the dominance of mammals and the emergence of humans. It's a tale of survival, adaptation, and evolution at its best. As we look around us today, all the life forms we see are the end result of billions of years of chance, catastrophe, and change. And the story is far from over. We are but a small, fleeting chapter in the grand narrative of life on Earth. A truly humbling perspective, isn't it? We are a part of this incredible journey, interconnected to every living creature that has ever existed and will ever exist. Thank you, listeners, for joining us on this fascinating exploration. If you enjoyed this episode, please blast that like button, share your thoughts in the comments, and share this episode with your friends. Let's spread the awe of our shared history. And remember, Every day brings a new opportunity to learn something that makes you say, wow. So keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep marveling at the wonders of our universe. Absolutely. Stay curious, folks. Until next time, this is Curiosity Wonderland. Take care and keep wondering. Today's Curious Journey was inspired by an article titled, What Was It Like When Mammals Appeared and Thrived? Written by Ethan Siegel and published on Big Think on April 3, 2024. If you want to delve deeper into the subject, the full URL is in the video description. Until next time, stay curious, folks.